Hi everyone, we'll, we'll just give uh, people another minute to connect with the Zoom link and then I'll have some initial remarks and we'll, and we'll get right to the science. Okay, um, so I think it makes sense as people are, are, are coming in to, to get started. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to our inaugural uh, Variant Effects Seminar Series. Uh, presumably you all are here because of your connection with the Alice Variant Effect Alliance. Um, so you know that it's sponsored by, by us, uh, all of us. Um, our aspiration for this seminar series uh, is to eventually make it um, a, a fully public one. Um, a fully public one so that we can engage a broader community as well. Uh, but this is this is the very first one. And so um, we're certainly glad that 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 you're here. Um, so just a couple of, of housekeeping items for the, the talks, um, which will run with questions up to about an hour uh, or to in total, not each. Um, so yeah, if you can just if you can just make sure you're on mute, um, we'll, we'll also mute and unmuters if necessary. <laughs> Keep yourself on mute. Um, we will have time for Q&A. You can put questions uh, in Zoom chat at any time and we'll harvest them to ask the speakers later. Or you can also raise your hand um, using the, the uh, raise hand feature in, uh, in, in Zoom um, uh, after the talk to be called on uh, live. But if you would refrain from just shouting out questions, that would, that would be great. Um, uh, remember that there's a variant effect seminar series uh, Slack channel on our on our A of Slack. So if you want to go there, you can you know ask questions of speakers, continue the discussion, uh, and so on. And then uh, you all got the recording notice. But just as a reminder, this meeting is recorded and will be on our um, YouTube channel for people people to find. And um, perhaps the most important thing that I have to ask of you relative to the seminar series is that, you know, we've generated a few initial ideas for speakers among the executive committee, but would really like to get um, input from the community on who we'd like to see uh, at this series. And that includes like self-nomination, right? So if you're a trainee um, uh, and you have a cool story and you want to tell it, you should get in touch and, um, and let us know. Uh, or if you're a lab head, um, or if you have a colleague who's done something cool, um, please please nominate them so that um, so that we can uh, we can uh, continue the series. Okay. Um, also, we'll abide by our Atlas of Variant Effects Alliance code of conduct during this meeting. So just um, you know, you can go to the link that's on the on the screen and read about it um, in detail, and you should. But you know, just to summarize, um, we would like everyone to be respectful and to use welcoming and inclusive inclusive language uh, in their in their questions. Okay, so just a very quick summary of what we've been up to in uh, in Ave. We did release our white paper publicly. We're working on um, a, a formal publication as well. A membership has grown to over two hundred folks, which is great from ten countries. Um, our work streams have been hard at work developing uh, what they plan to do for the next year or so in the form of strategic roadmaps, and those will be available for everyone to look at and comment on at some point in October, most likely. Um, and then uh, I already covered this seminar series, which is the other big thing we're trying to do. So please do let us know if you find uh, it interesting or useful, uh, if you have comments, good or bad. Um, that would be that would be great. I already said that we want people to nominate themselves or others, uh, so so please do that. And then um, the last big item is uh, our annual symposium. Uh, this year we're sort of setting it free from Seattle. It'll be in Toronto uh, um, in 2022. Um, so if you haven't already marked the dates June 13th and 14th on your calendar, um, you should do that if you're interested in attending, which which I hope you are. I'm certainly excited to see all of you in person. Uh, finally, so. Um, today, I'm going to introduce our two speakers uh, uh, right up front, um, and they'll run uh, they'll run a talk, and then uh, questions, and then the next and then the next talk. Um, and so we're we're you know really lucky to have uh, two folks who've done just really exciting work in our field. One um, more from the computational and uh, predictive side, 
and that's Farah Munoz from the Nuria Lopez Bigas Lab in Barcelona. Um, Farron is a, is a postdoctoral fellow uh, there where he's been working on computational cancer genomics and published just a really exciting and provocative paper uh, last year, which I, I think he's going to, uh, uh, I think he's going to tell us about, um, that looks at the, at, at, at sort of the interplay between mutagenesis and selection in cancer, uh, among, among other things. Um, and then next, we'll have a, a recording uh, of a talk from uh, Steve uh, Irwood, who's a PhD student in uh, Ron Cohen's laboratory at um, the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. So Stephen sends his regrets. He's actually off on a job interview today. So we could not we could, we could not have anticipated that. Um, and it's a bit of a sadness. But uh, one of the, the key collaborators on that pa paper, uh, Dr. Evgeny Avakine, is uh, going to show up to answer questions about the work that he'll be talking about, which is related to the use of um, prime editors for conducting mutational scans. So with that, I will uh, turn it. I will turn it over to Farhan and just uh, again welcome all of you. Okay, uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can hear you. Yeah, okay, uh, hopefully you can see you can see also the screen. Uh, so I will just uh, go for, go. for the... Perfect. Okay, uh, so thanks very much for the for the kind introduction, Doug, and, and thanks especially for the organizers and, and for, for Lara and Steven who have been very helpful this, uh, in the preparation of this meeting. I'm very excited to be here. And I will be presenting searching for driver mutations with uh, computational tools. Uh, the main theme of the of the talk will be will be related to to cancer and mutations. And uh, it's impossible to talk about this project without uh, without uh, explaining a little bit about a previous project, which is Intogen. Intogen is one of these uh, large uh, flagship projects of the lab. Uh, in its essence, it's uh, a bioinformatics pipeline in which, uh, uh, starting from a collection of, of uh, many sequenced tumors uh, collected and, and sequenced by uh, several large-scale initiatives, uh, we have been capable to run uh, several driver discovery methods uh, to create a, a good catalog of, of cancer genes. Uh, to date, uh, we have 568 cancer genes across 66 cancer types. And um, there are several strategies that these driver discovery methods uh, can apply to um, uncover with genes uh, harbor signals of positive selection that makes them uh, a firm candidate of, of being involved in tumor genesis. I will not uh, dig very deep into that. Uh, just mentioning that uh, Intogen uh, generates uh, a lot of data as a result of the, of the analysis pipeline. And uh, the next question one may ask is, uh, okay, um, we have a good catalog of cancer genes. Uh, what about the mutations uh, that are responsible for these, uh, for these signals of positive selection? Can we tell apart which mutations uh, in these genes are uh, being responsible for the tumorigenic effects? From the analysis uh, pipeline, we can, uh, we can derive two, two very simple analyses. The first one is that uh, observing that most mutations in cancer genes are of uncertain significance as of the uh, current uh, uh, manually curated catalogs of mutations such as CLIMBAR and OncoKB. Uh, less than 13% uh, of, of all mutations observed in, in endogen uh, in, in cancer genes are, uh, have, have some level of annotation in these, in these datasets. So there is a big gap still to 
uh, to uncover. Um, and this is uh, this is an important question, not only from the basic perspective, but also from the from the uh, translational and clinical applications. The second observation that we can make uh, using the samples that have been collected in Indochen is that uh, not all genes in all tumor types uh, uh, have revealed um, the same the same uh, scope or in terms of the mutational landscape. Whilst uh, in some genes like beta catenin here in hepatic cancer, uh, we have sequenced uh, enough samples to uh, be more or less confident that it's unlikely that that uh, that new many new mutations arise as we sequence new samples. In in other cancer genes, uh, this uh, this picture is not uh, is not fulfilled uh, in the sense that we expect to see uh, new mutations in these genes even if we sequence the new new samples. We can measure the bend of this fitting curve uh, using a what we call a discovery index. And this gives us a, an idea of how far we are from having uh, seen all the, all the possible mutations that would operate in, in, in a tumorigenic way in a, in a cancer, in a specific uh, tumor type. So with these remarks, uh, we see that uh, there is uh, quite, quite a significant gap for, uh, for room for improvement. And, and there is also a need to, to understand uh, the problem of which mutations in cancer genes are capable of driving tumor genesis. And this is what this, uh, this project uh, is, is, is all about. I will, I will try to explain what is our approach to this kind of computation and analysis and, um, and how we see the, the future applications or future utility of this, of this information. So, as mentioned, we, we start from we start from from Intogen, and Intogen gives us a wealth of, of information about about the mutations that are present in those uh, cancer genes. Um, so we figured out that we could devise some sort of supervised learning approach in which we could compare two sets of mutations. Uh, those mutations that are likely drivers because they are mapping to a cancer gene and they are in a context with a um, high positive selection. I will explain later what that means. And on the other hand, we could, uh, we could assemble a, a, a set of likely passengers, uh, namely those, uh, those mutations that we would expect to see just by chance. Uh, for example, mutations that follow uh, the background mutational uh, probability. Um, this, has been, uh, this has been studied a lot and uh, we have a we have a decent sense of uh, what the, the neutral mutagenesis in, in cancer um, looks like. Using these two sets of mutations, we can aspire to uh, endow these mutations with some level of information that is relevant for the classification and uh, use these, uh, these information as, as features for, uh, for, for correct classification of, of unseen uh, mutations. We may be thinking about uh, for example, if the mutation is mapping to a linear cluster or a 3D cluster, uh, as revealed in in uh, in, in cohorts of, of tumors, or whether the mutation is mapping to a site that is highly conserved, uh, thus uh, we may think that this site is is um, has a has a non-trivial uh, functional impact if if it's altered, or we may also be thinking about. Uh, mutations hitting a, a PFAM domain that is uh, enriched in, in mutations, or whether the mutation is uh, in a context such that we, we can think that uh, there is a high chance that this mutation is a drag. Uh, as, as you know, in the, uh, or as you may not know, in Intogen, we also run uh, BNDS, the method by Inigo Martin Corena, and we have a uh, we have an estimate of uh, how strong the effect of, of positive selection is in each consequence, in each coding consequence type. So if we are analyzing a cohort of, of breast and we are looking to uh, a, specific, uh, a, a specific driver, for instance, uh, P10, we may have a good sense of how many, how, how many of the mutations in excess we are observing compared to the ones that we would expect in by chance. Um, in the work by Inigo, this is this is um, uh, studied as 
as, as a DNDS and, and is, is, is properly formalized. And from that, we can derive a, a probability that the mutations we are observing are, are real types, although we may, we may not be totally sure. So in our mind, the, uh, the setup for, for this supervised learning approach uh, should have this uh, ability to generate the data for training, uh, having uh, two sets of mutations. Those uh, drivers would be those of cell mutations in a high positive selection context. And on the other hand, those passenger mutations, which would be uh, randomly selected mutations according to the background mutational profile. Uh, we should also take into account, uh, and this was uh, something uh, we were very interested in, uh, we, we wanted to take into account that uh, the gene tumor type context may be uh, very, very unique uh, in the sense that uh, maybe not all the rules, not, not all the instances, uh, not all the times the gene is found driver in different tumor types uh, uh, is explained by the same mechanisms. Uh, we, we may find uh, some, some prominent examples uh, later in the presentation. And also we, we want to have some measure of how well we are, we are doing in the task of learning these, uh, these, these features and learning to distinguish between drivers and passengers. Uh, representativeness of the training examples uh, via the discovery index is, is handy. And we also uh, use uh, out of bag accuracy. We try to uh, arrange the, the training in such a way that we have um, we have some sets of mutations that are not uh, being part of the training and where we evaluate the, the performance of our models. So I will just very briefly guide you through an example of how the how a model uh, is, is trained according to these principles that I just described. So we start from a cord of, of, of lung adenocarcinoma, and we are interested to know uh, whether, whether we can train a model that distinguishes drivers from passengers in EGFR, in the gene EGFR. Uh, we start with a set of, of observed mutations in a high positive selection context, and we, we compare this set of mutations to our, another set of mutations which are basically randomly selected uh, using the background uh, profile that we can infer from the cohorts of lung adenocarcinoma. Then uh, we adopt an ensemble approach, which is we are not going to use all the mutations uh, uh, at once. Uh, we are going to train weak learners that uh, learn from subsets of mutations. So each learner uh, just sees a partial view of all the, of all the uh, mutational, mutational landscape. And um, Later, we combine all these base uh, models, so all these weak learners, we combine them into a, into a single model. And uh, there, are, there, are some, uh, there are some sensible um, uh, motives to do it uh, like this. One, one, of the, one of the main uh, uh, reasons is to, to ensure that we are not overfitting the model. And from this, uh, from this operation of learning, uh, uh, having having assembled the training sets and uh, using uh, a, train, a gradient boosting machine, uh, and then assemble these models, we can cast a classification and an explanation. I will, for classification, it's very clear. I will later explain what what I mean by explanation. All in all, uh, for each uh, gene and tumor type, uh, we can uh, do this uh, construct, and uh, we can get as well an evaluation of how how effectively uh, our model is separating uh, the likely drivers from the likely passengers using the features that we have fit it on. Note that the set of features is very reduced and it is susceptible to be, to be enlarged uh, eventually. And uh, I can almost assure that it will um, in time as the, uh, as the model um, evolves. As we as we continue to do some some tests and see what are the what are the room uh, the places where the where the model can can improve, I will just uh, show you here an example of uh, how the uh, predictions at the observed mutations look like. So here I am representing the observed mutations in EGFR in lung adenocarcinoma and in glioblastoma. We have these two different scenarios, and we can observe that uh, first. Not all the observed mutations are predicted as drivers. And this is important. This is, this is a confirmation and an illustration that our model is not overfitting. And uh, second, that the, the explanations uh, of the model are the rules that the model is using are very different. By explanation in the previous slide, I mean that 
we can uh, break down each single prediction into a uh, sum of local explanations. This is done using uh, something that is called Shapley additive explanations uh, or SHAP for short. This is a common technique in, it starts to be a common technique in machine learning. And uh, it's, it's proven to be very useful. This, this kind of explanations uh, on, a, on a mutation wise manner are, can be also called uh, local explanations because uh, the explanations are uh, describing the decision of the model on a, on a mutation wise manner, not in general. So um, this, is, this is just an illustration of how different two, two models can be and how different two training sets can be uh, given the same, the same gene, but different tissues, different tumor type contexts. Uh, from all the models that we can train, each point in these in these diagrams uh, represents represents a model uh, labeled by a gene and tumor type. Uh, we select a, a subset of them, uh, which uh, the ones that fulfill some some requirements. Uh, the the cross validation or out of back uh, performance has to be above uh, zero point eight f score. But also, we want to ensure that the number of mutations is sufficiently high. The number of terminal mutations is sufficiently high as a function of the discovery. Normally, if the discovery index is low, we want to we want to enforce more mutations for the training to be reliable. And the other way around, if the discovery is high, uh, it means that we have seen almost all the mutations that that uh, we could see, and thus uh, we we deem the set of mutations representative enough, and we don't uh, we can relax a little bit the condition on the on the number of mutations for training. Uh, we can see some relation, some interesting relationships uh, that, in the interest of time, I will I will skip. But we can uh, we can discuss on them later in the in the Q and A. Uh, so this is uh, what I was explaining to you. Uh, this this is what a local explanation for a mutation means. This is CGFR. This leads into our gene uh, mutation in in LUAT. And uh, this is essentially telling us that uh, in deciding that this mutation should be a driver, uh, the model is, is, is making the decision upon uh, basically three or four features. Uh, the fact that the, that the mutation may be in a linear cluster, the fact that the mutation may be in a 3D cluster. Uh, and uh, you can see that we are employing other features uh, some of which uh, are not uh, as frequently used them, uh, as, as others. But uh, we, can, we can generalize this analysis to, to all the mutations. I will, I will not devote a lot of time uh, here. Uh, you can see uh, in the BoostDM website, uh, which I will provide the link in the end of the talk, uh, you, can, you can browse uh, all the mutations that we have, we have analyzed, and uh, in particular these ones. Uh, but, uh, the take home message here is that the, the landscape of, of explanations can be quite different. As well, we can, we can portray the, uh, how, the, how, how, the predictions, uh, how the predictions look uh, when we consider all the possible mutations in a, in a given gene. Here we see a hotspot in this uh, beta TRCP digram. Um, and uh, uh, this the, this hot, hotspot may be explained by the fact that there is uh, uh, there is hampering the negative regulation of of, of beta catenin. These these mutations may be hampering the motive that uh, promotes uh, uh, proteasome degradation of the of the gene. Uh, we have seen this before, but uh, uh, we can and in the web of of WSDM you can you can look at all the examples. We can we can just uh, confirm that. Uh, uh, the kind of mutations, the, the 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 shape of the of the blueprint is can be very different from one to one type to another. Uh, this is this is just an example uh, which is very prominent the GFR, and um, it justifies the fact that uh, that we have uh, uh, we have taken the, the the precaution to to do this uh, this kind of analysis on a on a tumor type uh, gene. Um, basis independently. So just just very briefly, in order to in order to validate this approach, it's not sufficient to uh, to check the out of bag validation. We also want to to see what happens with uh, with mutations that are not included in, in our pipeline. 
So in this case, we took some uh, mutations, low frequency mutations that have been uh, validated for oncogenicity uh, in, uh, in grafted tumors in mouse models. And uh, what we did is we removed uh, completely these mutations from the boost DM pipeline and we trained the models anew. And we we just uh, we just confirmed that the uh, the models trained with the with the mutations with a holdout data set, which in this case is is the mutations uh, we are we are analyzing, uh, the concordance between the score of was DM and the and the results the experimental results was quite was quite good. Uh, we did the same exercise with a with a similar assay uh, using uh, mutations in lung cancer, and the bottom line of this analysis is that uh, in in some sense, we are we are recapitulating well the uh, the, the the results or the conclusions of, of uh, experiments uh, without without having to necessarily to conduct the experiment. It's true that this 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 is possibly the the the, the strongest evidence. This kind of data from these from these papers is the strongest evidence we can we can afford to uh, for the sake of validation. We also compare to other uh, to other annotations. Uh, we compare to uh, uh, experimental saturation mutagenesis assays in in, in different genes. Uh, those genes for which we had uh, already a, a, a good model, uh, and uh, the conclusion was that uh, if we if we apply these scores as predictors in uh, mutations that have been not used for for the training of the model. Uh, we we have a quite high precision. We have a higher precision than uh, BUSDM has a higher precision, uh, a higher accuracy than uh, than the than the scores. So there is there is a lot of information that is being carried uh, in the in the BUSDM that it's also uh, it's also there. It's also in the experimental saturation mutagenesis, but. Uh, we can we can prove that uh, a better out of back prediction with uh, with our models in some in some genes. Uh, we also did the exercise of, uh, of comparing against other bioinformatic approaches, and the, the results were were consistent with what I just shown to you. If we see uh, uh, TP53 across all the tumor types where we where we were capable to map all the scores, uh, we see that there is. Uh, there is a quite a quite decent behavior by the by the boost DM approach, and we can see this uh, this behavior in other other genes and, and tumor types. Uh, here in this plot, I'm just showing how the precision, how the how the performance uh, compares against the the one that we could get if if the prediction was based on on the on the mutagenesis score or in the bioinformatics score. So. Having said that, uh, and just uh, just very quickly, the next thing we did uh, was to interrogate, ask ourselves. Uh, now we have observed, uh, we have analyzed uh, mutations, all the mutations in each gene. We have produced 185 high quality models, and uh, we wonder why uh, some of the predicted drivers by Boost DM are not being observed. So we asked this question, and, and we. We conjecture that this may have to do, or in part at least, with the with the mutational probability. So what we did was mapping the mutational probability that we were able to infer from the background mutation profile uh, to each of the mutations predicted as drivers, and we we divided it between those that have been observed in intogen and those that have not been observed, and we we saw uh, in some cases a striking. Uh, propensity towards uh, the observed mutations to have more more probability. Uh, this may seem it may seem intuitive, but it's not uh, it's not completely trivial. Maybe maybe in the discussions we can bring this up. Uh, with the exception, this propensity is 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 not as is not as strong uh, in some in some oncogenes. So this gives us some sense that uh, there is some. There is probably some uh, some way of exploiting this kind of uh, remark or this this kind of observation to to assess what is the uh, um, positive selection strength or or bottleneck strength of of a mutation or oncogenic mutation. Uh, just because uh, I am I am uh, 
surpassing the, the, the time is, is schedule. I will just uh, I will just very briefly recall that uh, um, that we have uh, we have included the results of BOSDM in the Cancer Genome Interpreter, which is a tool for the uh, clinical interpretation of, of, of variants. Uh, we believe that the, the BOOSDM uh, outputs that we are getting are useful in order to provide a new layer of, of interpretability and close, uh, at least narrow the interpretability gap that I show you in, the, in one of the first slides. And also recall that uh, we have uh, a, lot of, a lot of material. We, we have the paper we, we recently published and uh, we have also some websites that may be useful for for understanding better and, and even using the, the outputs uh, of, of this method. So without further ado, I just want to thank all the people in my lab and in particular my, my, my colleagues, my, the co-authors of, of this work. And I am very happy to take, uh, to take questions. Thanks very much. We'll have a few minutes for Q and A, um, and please post your uh, questions anytime to the Zoom chat. But if you would like to raise your hand, um, we can call on you for some live questions here for the next few minutes. I see one from uh, Dr. McDermott. Hi, Fran. Nice, uh, great presentation. Uh, a bit of question in chat. How well does this approach work in hypermutated cancers, poly MSI? Because there we've had, there's been difficulty establishing a background mutation rate, even to identify cancer genes. Do, does this approach work in that setting? Yeah, uh, that's, that's an excellent point. Um, uh, as part of the intogen pipeline, we are, uh, we are filtering uh, hypermutagenesis. So um, since since BOOSDM starts from the uh, from the results of the from the results of the of the pipeline of Intogen, uh, we are uh, just just for, for the same just for being on the safe side, we are just uh, skipping this this kind of uh, this kind of scenarios. So so in in particular in the in, in the Intogen pipeline, we are making sure to filter. Um, um, to fit the, this, this kind of cases in which we may have a hypermutagenesis and it's not, uh, it's not a direct effect of, of positive selection, but uh, just, just an effect of, of target activity of some, of some uh, mutagenic uh, mechanism. So, and, so and, is the, and, and is, the, is the solution for that ultimately simply having a large enough sample set? Because it seems like we, we keep avoiding this type of analysis and we exclude the hypermutators from all of these types of computational approaches. I'm, I'm not completely sure about that. Um, and this, this is a question that has been lurking in the lab for a, for, for a long time. Uh, maybe, maybe there should be a, a, a specific approach like the one that we took for, for Intogen, but for this kind of uh, uh, this, this kind of uh, this kind of a scenarios in which uh, we have this uh, uh, extremely anomalous uh, mutagenesis, but uh, it's it's a good point. It's something to take into account. Yeah. Thanks. I think we have time for uh, one more live question. If anybody has has a question. And uh, if, we, if we missed you today, just go ahead and put it in chat, any questions. And uh, I think for keeping with time, I'll go ahead and uh, we have uh, Dr. Stephen Airwood uh, is not, since his apologies, he's not av available to be here today. So we were playing a recording, uh, but Dr. Iva Kine is on hand for any live Q and A.
So hello everybody. Today I'm going to be talking about a project I've been working on where I've been trying to do saturation variant interpretation using CRISPR prime editing. So to give a bit of context for what I've been working on, we all know that the human genome was sequenced for the first time in about 2001. But since then, the cost of sequencing a genome has fallen precipitously, such that now sequencing a whole genome has become rather routine. As we aggregate all the data from these genomes, such as what's being done by the NOMAD team, we found a staggering amount of variation across the human population. So what I would argue is that the new Human Genome Project is trying to understand what all of this variation does. And I would argue that we're not doing the best job of that right now. So if we look at all of these documented variants, we find that less than 1% of them have an associated clinical interpretation. And so there's many ways you can go about linking a given variant to a clinical or functional uh, interpretation. What I'm going to be talking about today is something called multiplex saturation genome editing. And what that entails is delivering a Cas9 enzyme alongside a library of donor templates, each one encoding each of the possible nucleotide substitutions across your targeted region. You deliver that to a pool of cells. Hopefully each cell gets one of the possible mutations. And then you have to perform some functional assay that will help you understand what the functional significance of each of those variants are. So if we were to do that in this example here, we can say that our functional assay results in death of any cell containing a pathogenic variant. So if we delivered our uh, CRISPR library to the cells here, each one getting one of the possible mutations, we would then sequence that population, perform the functional assay, and then sequence that population again. And what you would notice in this example here is that there's a complete loss of the green cells and a reduction in the red cells, whereas the blue and yellow cells stay about the same. And from that, we might infer that the red and the green cells carry pathogenic variants, whereas the blue and yellow variants are benign. And so this approach has been used to great effect. Uh, Jay Shinduri's group published the interpretation of about 3,000 different variants in BRCA1 using this method. Um, when I began working on this project, however, there were two things that I wanted to address. The first is that with most genome editing technologies, you get really low product purity. And what I mean by that is if you have a diploid cell line, you're much more likely to find a cell where each allele has two different mutations on it than you are to find editing outcomes where both alleles have the exact same editing outcome. As a result of this, it becomes really difficult to disentangle the, given effect, of, the effect of any given mutation. The way the Shindari group got around this was by using the HAP1 cell line. So HAP1 cells are a near haploid human cell line uh, which makes them great for looking at mutations in isolation. The downsides, however, is that HDR is prohibitively low. Um, their ploidy is highly unstable, so it actually takes quite a bit of work to maintain these cells as haploid in culture. And then obviously, given their haploid nature, there's some questions about their physiological relevance. So what I wanted to do was develop a strategy where we could get the benefits of the HAP1 cells while sidestepping some of those downsides. And the idea I had was to generate haplidized gene loci. And what I mean by this is that you take your diploid cell and you just generate an allele-specific deletion on one of the two alleles so that you would lose a fragment on one allele while the other one remains intact. And so what this looks like in practice, this is an example using the MPC1 gene in HEC293T cells. And if you look at the sequencing here, you can actually tell that the locus here is triploid because the A nucleotide is represented in about one third compared to the G nucleotide in both instances. So what we wanted to do was develop an allele specific CRISPR strategy where we would, where we would get just get cleavage on the two alleles containing the G nucleotide in each cases and no cleavage on the allele containing the A nucleotide, which would, make, which would generate deletions on those two alleles while leaving the other one intact. And so after we do this, this is what you look like, this is what you find now. So the sequencing traces here appear to be homozygous for um, that more minor A nucleotide in each cases, indicating that those other two alleles have been removed. And so what I would argue is that this haplidization strategy generalizes saturation genome editing. So these haplidized cells are great in that you can effectively model mutations in isolation. Um, and they can be translated to any given cell type, including non-cancer, stably diploid cells, such as RPE1. So ultimately, cell line selection can be made based on phenotype or physiology rather than a strict reliance on this HAP1 cell type. 
So with these haplidized cells, I started to work on a project surrounding a disease called Neiman-Pick disease type C. So Neiman-Pick disease type C is a lysosomal storage disorder caused by autosomal, autosomal recessive mutations in a gene called MPC1. So this disease is fatal by about ages 15 to 25. And the hallmark symptoms include a global ne neurodegeneration and enlargements of the spleen and liver. And all of these symptoms result of an inability to transport cholesterol throughout the cells. So MPC1 is a lysosomal protein that will move cholesterol from the lysosome to other cellular compartments. And what makes MPC1 a good candidate for saturation genome editing is that the genotype-phenotype relationship is really poorly understood. So to date, more than 400 disease-causing mutations have been identified. Most patients pretend, present as compound heterozygotes, often harboring one mutation that's entirely unique to their family. And so as a result of this, it makes it very difficult to understand the impact of any given mutation, which has left our ability to uh, discern, to predict the phenotypic outcomes of any mutation as really poor. And obviously this is going to impede uh, treatment administration and genetic counseling efforts. So I, again, am using this haplidized cell line. And what I'm showing you that's new here is a Western blot, which shows that in the haplidized cell line, um, you have about one third the protein expression as the parental wild type cell line. And so this uh, indicates that this cell line is functionally haploid. So it's only expressing MPC1 from that one remaining allele. And so instead of using the HDR based strategy that I outlined previously, I was interested in using this new CRISPR prime editing technology. And so very briefly, the way this works is you have a Cas9 nickase enzyme, which is fused to a reverse transcriptase. And the other difference is that it uses something called a prime editing guide RNA. And the difference between a prime editing guide RNA and a normal guide RNA is that a prime editing guide RNA, or PEG RNA, has, a th has an elongated 3' prime extension. And on that 3' prime extension is actually what you, where you encode your edit of interest. So what happens is the Cas9 comes, it binds, it nicks the PAM-containing strand, which then hybridizes with that elongated 3' prime extension. The reverse transcriptase then reverse transcribes whatever you've encoded in that 3' prime extension into the genome. Through a series of repair steps later, you end up getting your edited product. And so what I was interested in was how multiplexable this prime editing could be. So the good thing about prime editing is that you can use the same PEG RNA architecture to introduce mutations over a relatively wide window. So here you can see a C to T transition right at that PEG RNA NIC site. And you can, you can tell just by looking at the Sanger sequencing read that the editing efficiency is quite high. But using that exact same PEG RNA architecture and just swapping the nucleotide within the three prime extension there, you can encode an edit in this example here, 31 base pairs away, another C to T transition. And what you can appreciate is that the editing efficiency does not seem to drop precipitously as we go farther and farther away from that NIC site. So I designed a small pilot experiment where I designed a library of PEG RNAs, which would uh, encompass every possible nucleotide substitution within a 16 base pair window of MPC1. And what I wanted to understand was whether you could effectuate saturation genome editing using this strategy. And so uh, I performed next generation sequencing on the edited population. And what I found is that yes, indeed, you can get saturation genome editing. So each base, you can find its single nucleotide substitution to every other base. And there's two other things worth noting here. Uh, first is if you look at that top row there, that's the percentage of reads that map to wild type. And you can see that 42% of sequencing reads were mapped to the unmodified allele. Um, which indicates that 58% of reads were modified, which so you get really high editing efficiency with prime editing. And another thing, you can tell um, that each of these reads has a C to A mutation alongside the targeted mutation. So that mutation disrupts the PAM site from Cas9 rebinding and re-editing. Um, in our initial experiments, we thought that that might be necessary to ensure coverage of the entire library effectively so that once you get one edit, you don't have the Cas9 come, bind again, and re-edit that locus. Um, in our subsequent experiments, actually, we found that that's not necessary, so you can actually just introduce your edit of, your edit of interest with no pan modifying mutation, which makes this unique to HDR-based approaches, which necessitate that pan modifying mutation in addition to your mutation of interest. 
So now I had my cell model and my method for editing. The next I needed was that functional assay to delineate a path a functional to delineate a functional from non-functional variant. And so what I did was develop an assay based on the observation that MPC1 deficient cells have an expanded lysosomal compartment. So if you stain MPC1 deficient cells with the fluorescent dye called lysotracker, which is just a dye that will accumulate within the lysosomes of cells, you will find that the MPC1 deficient cells, which are on the right here, are much brighter than the wild types equivalent. And the great thing about this is that it seemed to translate well to a facts-based assay. So by performing fluorescence activated cell sorting on these cells, you can tell there's a pretty distinct separation between the wild type and MPC1 null cells. Um, what I was further interested in though before continuing was understanding the sensitivity of this assay. So basically, MPC1 is characterized by a very uh, heterogeneous uh, disease presentation. So some patients will develop symptoms at birth um, and their disease will progress very quickly, whereas other patients might not develop, start to develop symptoms until they're 8 to 15 years old and their disease might progress very slowly. And so a little bit of this can be attributed to mutations. So there are mutations that are associated with sort of later onset, less severe disease, and mutations that are uh, associated with very typical severe disease onset. And so I'm using this prime editing system. I made a few of those models. The first is the MPC1 P1007A. And so that's typically associated with a very late and mild uh, disease progression. And the other one is MPC1 I1061T, which is associated with very severe uh, and early disease onset. So I isolated each of these models, and you can tell just by looking at the Western blot here that these mutations clearly have a very can uh, that these mutations have very different impact on protein expression. So P1007A looks relatively indistinguishable from wild type, whereas MPC1 I1061T has reduced protein expression and it runs at a lower molecular weight than wild type equivalent. And so by staining these populations, I uh, performed the lysotracker staining and then the facts sorting of each of these clonal populations. And encouragingly, what I found was that uh, you can distinguish between, not only we could tell the difference between a wild type cell and this MPC1 P1007A, which is a typically very mild uh, disease causing variant, so that's great. We are sensitive enough to distinguish between even mild variants. But what's great too is that the MPC1 P1007A looks even distinguishable from MPC1 I1061T. So uh, not only might we be able to distinguish between a disease causing and a functional variant, we might be able to look, we might be able to start discerning relative uh, functionality of different variants based on this assay. So what we did was develop this facts-based pooled assay. So what we would do is we would design a library of peg RNAs. So we would take one target site, and these would range from about 13 nucleotides to about 50 nucleotides. So it would be about 40 mutations to 150 mutations simultaneously. We would deliver one of those libraries to a pool of cells. Each cell would get one of the possible mutations, and then we'd stain the cells and run them through the facts uh, sorter. We then gated the population into a low and high fluorescence population, and this was based on what the staining, uh, what the signal, what the liso tracker signal distribution of the wild type population looked like. Basically, we split that distribution right down the middle, with the bottom 50% of wild type control cells uh, corresponding to a low fluorescent population, and the top 50% of control cells corresponding to a high fluorescent population. So the assumption would be once we sort these out, extract the DNA and sequence the target locus, um, if we calculate the log fold change between those two populations, so how each mutation is distributed across those two populations, um, we would expect a benign variant to act like wild type. So you'd find it about equally on in both the low and high population. But uh, pathogenic variants, since we know those accumulate more lysotracker and are brighter, we would expect those to be disproportionately skewed towards the high population. And so by just sequencing these two populations and then quantifying the log fold change across these two populations, we were able to develop a function score for each of these variants. And so that's what you can see on the left here. It's just a histogram distribution of those scores. And what was encouraging at first is that a lot of our assumptions that we would make about a saturation genome editing experiment appear to be true. 
and that is that synonymous mutations all seem to cluster together, a function score of about one, and nonsense mutations all cluster together but apart from the synonymous mutations with a functional score of about zero. So what's great is you can actually use these function scores to classify variants. So we've developed an unsupervised class clustering algorithm which tries to identify the wild type cluster and then classifies everything with a score lower than that as deleterious. And so we've applied this strategy over about 16 different targeting experiments, so 16 different libraries. And in those 16 different experiments, we classified about 978 different MPC1 variants. And we have, uh, so we calculated a function score for each of those and then performed this unsupervised clustering. And what you can see on the right is the result of that clustering. And what sticks out is that MPC1 is clearly very sensitive to genetic perturbation. The vast majority of missense mutations are deleterious. Um, what's great is that, again, you see that the synonymous mutations are almost invariably functional, whereas the non-synonymous uh, mutations are invariably deleterious. And so as I mentioned before, we were a bit interested in understanding not only can we classify this as, as deleterious or functional, we we're interested in understanding if this function score actually means something about disease pathogenicity. So as you can tell in the histogram here, the missense mutations have quite a wide spread. So um, if a missense mutation has a score of about 0.5, is that meaningfully different from a missense mutation that has a score of about zero? And so to start addressing this, we isolated about 60 different clonal cell models from our different screens. And so what you can appreciate is that you can get pretty distinct impacts on protein expression and trafficking depending on the mutation that you're looking at. And so this is pretty well established. So MPC1 undergoes a pretty extensive post-translational modification as it traffics towards the lysosome. And so this is reflected in the Western blotting you can see. So some variants run as just a single lower molecular weight band. Those are variants that are unlikely to have been trafficked successfully whatsoever. And then you have some that run as a normal molecular weight, but with a reduced protein expression. And then you have some that are a bit in between. And so we came up with four different categories based on the Western blotting from about 60 of these different clones. And what we found was that the category that we grouped them in seemed to correspond quite well with the function score. So variants that ran just as a lower molecular weight band, indicating that they're unlikely to be successfully trafficked to the lysosome, tended to have scores that were really similar to the average nonsense score, which makes sense. If the protein's not making it to the lysosome, uh, then it's unlikely to be doing anything functionally productive. And comparing that to a variant that's in protein status subgroup 1, which is a variant with uh, expression comparable to wild type, you find that the function score is actually qu uh, quite a bit higher, which would make sense. And so to follow this up, we're interested in understanding whether we can draw any correlations between the function scores we've derived um, compared to known clinical outcomes of patients with these mutations. So not only can we classify something as, ben as uh, benign or deleterious, we might be able to have some insight into what disease progression might look like just based on this functional score. And to take this one step further, we wanted to confirm that the interpretations that we were making uh, were not unique to the HEC293T cell line. So we actually haplodized the RP1 cell line, which is a stably diploid cell line, and by chance it shared the same haplotype as HEC293Ts. So we were able to use the same guides that we used to haplodize MPC1 and HEC293T cells to haplodize this RP1 cell line. At the same time, we made a knockout cell line to confirm that the phenotype would be the same. That, and what we found, as you can see here, is that the MPC1 knockout RP1 cells clearly accumulate a lot more lysotracker than the wild type counterparts. Another question was how efficiently we were going to get prime editing to work in these cell lines. We took two of our verified libraries from the HEC293 T cells, delivered those to these RPE cells. What you can see is that you get very robust editing efficiencies. Um, so we delivered these libraries, did the exact same uh, experimental protocol we would do with the HEC293 T cells, uh, sorted the population, sequenced them, uh, de uh, derived the function score, and classified them. And what we were very encouraged to see was that there was a very high correlation between the function score made in HEC293 T cells, which is along the x-axis here, and the same function score that we would derive from the RP1 assays, which is on the y-axis here. Um, and so this seems to suggest that the function scores we've derived are highly reproducible across distinct cell lines. And so to summarize, uh, we've classified 978 different variants across 16 different PEG-RNA target sites. 
The target sites vary from uh, 13 to 43 nucleotides. Uh, one thing worth noting is that we did pre-screen each peg RNA in advance for activity. And so, uh, and in addition, where compared, our scores are highly reproducible across uh, the two different cell lines assayed. And our scores seem to reflect unique molecular defects within the MPC1 gene. And so with that, I'm going to leave off. Um, if you have any questions, you can send me an email or find me on Twitter. If you scan the QR code here, you can read more, uh, which is all detailed in the paper we put on BioArchive. So thanks a lot for your time. Excellent. So we have um, a question in the chat. Maybe we'll just kick it off uh, there. And uh, Take it away, Dr. Arvikain. Yeah, so we did try to use um, NG PAM containing the Cas9 variants, but not for but not for screening. So we know that they do work in our hands, and we can potentially make a library, but we have not used them to assay variants yet. Uh, I just try to read it. So I'll, I'll just start with the second question. So we use the libraries up to 43 um, nucleotides long, so we can cover a window of 43 base pairs. Essentially, it's 43 by 3, so um, around 120 variants we can cover in one screen. In terms of comparing to base editing screens, we have not done it side by side comparison, but I, I would imagine that there will be some differences uh, like inherent difference, because typically with base editing, additional bystander mutations are going to be introduced. So we have to always deal with those variants. So if windows are very clean and we can just introduce a mutation in a clean fashion, it's going to be like a variant, variant to variant comparison is going to be okay. So I think Stephen mentioned in the talk that predominantly we used libraries when we would mutate a PAM. So if you always had to think about it is that whatever variant we score, most of the times we are scoring a PAM silencing variant plus a variant. So we had to find the NGG PAMs that would introduce the silent mutations while we are changing it. So we just starting to get away from this. So we've done maybe a couple of libraries right now where we did not have to modify PAM region and it definitely works. So the windows that we can work right now is uh, a bit smaller. So it's about uh, 15 uh, nucleotides long, but at least we don't have to change a PAM region. So in this case, we can assay the variant just without substituting anything else. I think uh, so. The, the question is uh, whether we've seen any significant difference in editing rate for 13 base pair template uh, stretches compared to 43. It depends on the activity of a PAG. So, some of the, our PAGs, like 43 nucleotide long PAG, it was very active. So, we are getting the same output from it. And the rest, it just depends on, on what depth you want to sequence. For uh, for deep amplicon sequencing, I think we just have the one last question uh, in the chat, yeah. and then uh, for time. Thank you. Yeah, no, yeah. that is a that is a great question about nonsense variant, and I've been thinking about it myself. So uh, Stephen and I didn't have a chance to talk about it. I just saw some of the data today. Uh, Yes, they, it looks like they do have some, some, kind of, some kind of residual activity. How it happens right now, it's hard to say. There may be some read through is going on through these regions that uh, we can potentially maintain it. But there was one of the nonsense mutations that 
looks like in both hack cells and in RPE cells, we are seeing some residual functionality. So that's something we have to look deeper in. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you everybody for coming today. Uh, this is really great. And if uh, we look forward to seeing you on Slack or by email, um, thanks for coming. Thank you everybody. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you. Thank you.